we've arrived at our third message in our Jesus Is series. Have you enjoyed this series so far? Jesus Is. I want to mention something before I actually start this message today, and that is um, from last week's message. You guys remember we had the well that we had up here, and everybody had a cup that they wrote something on anonymously, and they dropped it into the well. Uh, we felt the Lord speaking to us this week, uh, and tonight we are going to have our prayer gathering together at 5 o'clock. We're going to do spirit-led giving, but we've also taken those cups, and we have made up the general categories where people are saying, I want to leave this behind in my life. And we have those categories, and we're going to put them on screen tonight, and we're going to pray over those areas that God would break those chains, and people would be set free, and we want you to come join us tonight to believe God for people's miracles this evening. So anyway, back to uh, the message today, Jesus is, it brings us to the third message in this series, Jesus is the final word. Jesus is the final word. I believe the enemy has won more battles and stopped more of God's people with this one word. I want you to write it down, capitalize it, write it big across the page. He stopped more individuals with this one word, discouragement. Discouragement has some brothers and sisters and cousins like disillusionment. You know, I think we can think of a lot of words that go along with that word, but it all starts with discouragement. It's perhaps the greatest tool in his arsenal. When God's people are discouraged, many of them stop believing, stop fighting, stop praying, and in many cases just give up on the things they believe God promised them. Because of discouragement, the enemy has won more battles without ever having to fight. How many of you know if the enemy can simply get you to give up and be discouraged, he can just move on to something else? And that's where a lot of people are today. There are many that are sitting in the church this morning. You are discouraged, and discouragement bleeds over into other areas of our lives. Discouragement can show up out of nowhere. It's like the former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis, a cowboy from Oklahoma, fought out of Chicago in the early 80s. He still remembers his first day in the Windy City after his arrival from Tulsa. He says in his own words, I got off the bus with my two suitcases under my arms in downtown Chicago, and I stopped in front of Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down, raised my hands up into the air, looked at the tower, and said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. When I looked down, my suitcases were gone. Discouragement can be a lot like that, right? We feel like we're going to conquer the world. We get hit out of nowhere, and then discouragement shows up when we least expect it. How do we handle discouragement when nothing is going our way, and it seems God is nowhere to be found? There are two sides to the coin when it comes to serving God and seeing God's activity in our lives. And I want you to write these things down. One side of the coin is what I call overt. Write that down. In fact, write out, out to the side of that, write this, God's overt activity. Overt. One side of the coin is overt. Overt means... Done or shown openly, plainly, readily apparent, not secret or hidden. We love when God operates in, a, in an overt fashion, don't we? We love when God shows up in our lives and we experience a promise, a vision, a dream. And then we get to see and experience God fulfilling that which he has promised for uh, to us, and he does it right before our eyes. How many of you have ever experienced that? You're seeing God work at home. You see God work in the workplace. You see God work in your finances. And man, you, you pray about something and there's a miracle. There is no high that's like experiencing the miracles of God in an overt fashion in our lives. Would you agree with that? 
It's amazing. It's awesome. But there's another side to this coin, and it's called covert. Write that down. God's covert activity. Covert means concealed, stealthy, not openly acknowledged, or undercover. This is the part of serving God that is much, much more difficult for us. When we believe God has given us a promise, a vision, a dream, but in no way do we see anything happening, and it looks like there's no remote possibility of a miracle coming our way. It's at this moment when you see no possibility and have zero understanding of what God is up to, discouragement can come in and take over. There is no low lower than when you need God the most and you sense his presence the least. This is when the danger of discouragement can take over and cause us to give up. What do you do when every bit of the news that you receive seems worse rather than better? The doctor's report, your bank account, doors are shutting all around you. The relationship is getting worse than ever. The vision, the dream, the promise seems further away than ever before. What do you do when it seems as though these things are impossible? Well, I am here to remind you of this one thing. Jesus is the final word. He's the final word. Today, we're going to look at God's covert operation in our lives. In fact, we're going to look at a story where it seems like all hope is gone. Discouragement has completely taken over in this story There are many important lessons to be learned to prepare us for the enemy's attack of discouragement when we don't understand what God is doing. The story we are looking at, many of you will be familiar with, it is the death of Lazarus. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to uh, John chapter 11. This is the story of how God works in covert ways. Not a single person in the story I'm about to recount to you understood what was going on. They didn't know what God was up to. But they were about to find out that Jesus has the final word. Let me quickly set up the story. Jesus receives word that his good friend Lazarus is dying. He is deathly ill, terminally ill. Lazarus is the brother of Martha and Mary. This family is personal friends of Jesus, and Jesus loves this family dearly. They're not acquaintances. He didn't just meet them uh, along the journey and move on. He spent time in their home. They've had gatherings. I'm sure they fellowshiped together. They were dear friends. And we can find that in this particular passage. Let's see a few of the scriptures. Let's start at John chapter 11, verse 3. Mary and Martha send the word to Jesus that their brother is deathly ill. And here's how they phrase it. Lord, the one you love is sick. And then in verse 5, it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then in verse 11, we find how close this relationship is again. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and it says, when he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus. These few passages reveal to us just how close of a relationship Jesus has with this family. You know, there's something pretty powerful about having friends that you can count on. How many of you have friends you know if something was to happen in your life, you could pick up that phone or text them and they would be there in a heartbeat? Raise your hand if you have that kind of friend. 
There are friends I have in my life, if they text me and they said, Mark, get here now, and they didn't even tell me what was going on, I would drop everything that I'm doing, and I would run to their aid to help them out, no matter what it is. How many of you have friends that are like that in your life? Isn't it awesome to be able to rely on those kind of individuals? Certainly, Jesus was that kind of friend. They had sent word to him that their brother was deathly ill, and they needed him and he was going to die without Jesus coming and certainly when Jesus received the word he dropped everything he was doing and he ran to their aid oh no he he didn't drop everything he was doing and run to them in fact look at verse 6 what did their dear friend do When he heard the word, it said, yet he had, when he had heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. What? Jesus knew of his his terminal illness. Jesus knew of the anguish the family was going through, yet he stayed where he was two more days. And not only that, we know Lazarus dies and Jesus doesn't arrive on scene for a minimum of four days. Four days of suffering and anguish for Martha and Mary. Four days of of sorrow and their good friend. The one who had the power to save. The one who could have healed their brother doesn't even bother to show up. How is this loving? Where was Jesus when I needed him the most? You ever ask yourself that same question when you're going through it and you don't know what's going on and you're like, God, where are you? What's going on? You made me these promises. I had this vision. God, you spoke to me about this. What is going on? Well, God's covert operation is revealed in this chapter. And even though he reveals it, they can't understand it. Let's go down through and let's look at the revelation in this passage of what Jesus is really up to. Let's follow from verse 4 on. Here's what it says. When Jesus heard this, meaning Lazarus' sickness, he said, this sickness shall not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. I want you to underline the word glory and underline the word glory glorify. This is key to understanding this particular passage and what Jesus is doing. Jesus identifies the thing that trumps even our pain and suffering and even our understanding. Here it is. Write it down. Somewhere is God's glory and God's purpose. The most important thing in this circumstance was God's glory and his purpose was about to reveal, his plan was about to reveal by glorifying his son. Now Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples what's happening. We get further understanding. Jump to verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. You can't get any plainer than that, can you? First, Jesus tries to use a metaphor. You know, he's trying to use a spiritual truth. Lazarus is sleeping, but they don't get it. They don't catch on. So finally, you know, Jesus gives up on that, and he just has to tell them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he told them, verse 14, excuse me, verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, But his disciples thought he meant sleep. Look at verse 14. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. What? 
He said that because there was trouble where they had just come from, and they were in fear for their lives. But Jesus explains what he's about to do, and Lazarus and the disciples are thinking they're going to go there to die. Even though Jesus has explained it, they just still didn't fully understand it. Here's another important revelation that you need to get in verse 15. Underline it. Here it is. For your sake. What if building your faith is more important than protecting you from pain. It is for God's glory. It is for God's plan. And it is for your sake. Look at verse 42. We get another revelation. And Jesus is standing before them. And he says, this is for the benefit of the people standing here. So what do we glean We don't always understand the plan or even the pain that we're going through. But I can guarantee you, it's always for something much, much bigger than we can imagine. And here is what I do know, and I want you to write it down. This will help you if you are discouraged with God's plan in your life. Here it is, the four things. It's for God's glory. It's for God's plan. It's for, you need to correct this in your notes, it's for our sake Write that down, and for others' benefit. You see, that's what the scripture means when it says, and God works all things for the good. He doesn't say all things are good, but he's saying, listen, you may not understand it, but I am covertly working. I am moving. I am ministering. I am doing something so much bigger than you can understand. I'm not just sitting up in heaven twiddling my thumbs and and killing time. I am at work in this situation. And you need to hold on to this fact that it's for God's glory, it's for God's plan, it's for our sake, and it's for the benefit of others. But if we're not careful, discouragement will set in and we'll, we'll simply give up. You, you talk about discouragement. Let's continue the story. It's everywhere. When Jesus finally arrives and Martha and Mary were there. They were devastated as far as they were concerned. As far as they knew, their brother is dead. It is over. Jesus never cared to show up to save him. And so now here he comes after we've already had the funeral. When Jesus finally shows up, the sisters had two different reactions to the same disappointment. And I believe you might see yourself in one of these two. Lazarus has now been dead for four days The women are being uh, cared for and comforted by their friends and family. And we pick up the story in verse 20. And it says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him and Mary stayed home. Both are suffering. Both have the same discouragement. Both are hurting at the loss of their brother. But there are two different reactions and responses to this situation. Martha runs out and confronts Jesus and really wants some answers. She goes out and she meets him and she makes this statement in verse uh, 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. What is lying behind that? If you cared, if you were concerned, if you would have really taken the time, you could have saved my brother. And then Jesus responds to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And so she says back to him, I, yeah, 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 I, I know, you're going to resurrect us on the last day. She already, had the, she already knew the answer. I ask you, how many of you are like her? You go out, right? So we got two types of people. We have, we have Martha who goes out and confronts. And what does Mary do? Mary stayed behind. And in fact, Jesus had to call for her. Look at verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When discouragement sets in, there are one of two ways. We confront and we want our questions answered, 
God, where were you? Kind of anger can set in. We run out. Let me, let me see. How many of con- my confronters do I have? You want answers. When, when God's not showing up, raise your hand. You're like, I can't deal with this. God, what are you doing? Where are you? Where are my confronters? Yeah, you're out there. You heard Jesus is coming. He don't have to get to my house. I'm going to go meet him. But what about, my, what about my others? The reaction is you just fall down. You, you kind of give up. You are the, you're, you're, you're a puddle of tears. That's what happened to Mary, a puddle of tears. She was the sensitive one. Where's all my sensitive ones? You just kind of melt. <laughs> no matter how you react to overwhelming circumstances, here's what I want you to know. Jesus didn't chastise either one of them. He dealt with them differently. For Martha, he answered her questions. He went out and he spent time with her, talking to her. And for Mary, the sensitive one, you know what he did? He wept alongside her. One stood in front. The other fell at his feet. But Jesus loved him the same. Two women, two different reactions to the same circumstance. Even the crowd criticized him. They're chastising him about what had happened. Look at verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who opens the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Is this not the accusation that's still happening in our world today? Aren't people still saying, well, if God could stop it, then why did he allow it to happen? Are we still getting those questions today? It was evident back then. The one who opened blind eyes, couldn't he kept the man from dying? Why did he allow this? As far as everyone was concerned, the circumstance was over. But Jesus has them take him to the tomb You see, the tomb, the graveyard, is a place where things come to die. The graveyard is a place of finality. Think about some of your hopes, dreams, visions, and promises. You see no way for them to come to pass. And the enemy shouts, it's over. It'll never happen. Quit praying about it. Stop believing for it. Quit fighting for it. Then discouragement comes in, and it takes over, and ultimately discouragement breaks you. I was watching the NCAA College National Wrestling Championships yesterday. Many of you know I used to be a a wrestling coach for a lot of years. And they came to the finals and they interviewed this one young man who was coming up on his finals match. And they said to him, what do you enjoy the most about wrestling and getting out there and grappling with these other guys and, 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 and fighting these matches out. And he said, well, number one, I, l- I love going out and winning the match. That's what I'm here for. I don't believe I'm going to lose. I go out to win. And he said, but you know what else I also like? I love it when I break a guy in a match. We're fighting back and forth. And then all of a sudden, I can feel it in him. His will breaks and he gives up. And once he gives up, I know the fight is over. And I know I'll be victorious. You know what thought hit me? That's what the enemy wants to do to God's people. You see, he wants to bring discouragement in. He wants to break your will to take the fight out of you. And once he takes the fight out of you, you just quit fighting altogether. Maybe you've heard the story about African elephants that they keep in captivity with nothing more than a a small stake and a rope. Do you know how they accomplish this? They take these great beasts and when they first get them, they will take them and chain them by the leg to a large pole and that elephant will pull and pull and pull to try to free itself. But there comes a time when something breaks in that elephant and it quits pulling altogether. In fact, it will barely get to the end of the chain and tug any longer. When that happens, the trainer now will come over and replace the chain with a rope and replace the pole with a small stake that they'll put in the ground. And no matter where they stake this elephant, it will never pull against that stake again because the spirit of the animal has been broken. How many of you know that's what the enemy wants to do to us? You see, if he can get you to give up on this dream... You'll quit dreaming altogether. 
If he can get you to give up on this promise, you'll quit believing for future promises. How many people are filled in our churches throughout America? They've just given up. They're waiting for Jesus to come back. They've been hurt by the church. They tried ministry and it didn't work out. They prayed for something and it didn't go their way. So they just sit in churches all throughout this land, no longer fighting, no longer trying to go out and do big things and dream big things for God, just sitting paying their time and waiting for Jesus to come. Churches are filled with those kind of folk. So what does Jesus do? He says, take me to the place where something has died. So they all go there, and when they arrive, this is what he says, and this is what they see. Look at verse 38. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been here for four days. Of course, it's Martha again speaking up, right? It's Martha telling Jesus. There are three things I see from this passage. When we've finally given up on a dream, a vision, a promise, a prayer, here are the three things that are before us. Number one, write it in. We see the stone. The stone that's rolled in front of a grave. The stone represents finality. It's over. It's immovable. It's impossible. There's no way this thing can happen. When we arrive at this place where we are so discouraged and discouragement is so great, the only voice I can hear is, it's impossible. It will never happen. Secondly, here's the second thing that comes into play. Write it in, the time factor Look at verse 39. By this time, he has been here for four days. There is no way this can happen. Too much time has passed. Not only does the enemy use the stone, which is immovable to his advantage, he uses time as his advantage. Time is one of the greatest factors in us giving up on God's dreams, visions, and plans for our lives. This is huge in our culture today. We live in the instant culture, don't we? Microwave generation. We want everything now. And when God doesn't move in five minutes, we're wondering where he is. How many of you know there is a difference between instant pudding and homemade pudding? There's a difference between a frozen pie and one that's been baked and put together by scratch. There's a difference between potatoes out of a box. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know if you can call those potatoes, man. I, I don't know what they are. There are some things in God's covert activity that he is doing that take time. And if you're not careful with time, the enemy will come in and say, ha, it's over. It's dead. God has forgotten you. It'll never happen. And the third thing that I want to look at is this, a bad stench. Look at verse 39. By this time, there is a bad odor. Do you know what happens to many of God's people? People, when, when dreams and promises don't happen, it leaves a bad taste in their mouths. They can't talk about that anymore. It's too painful. They don't want to think about it. The dream, the vision, the promise that used to bring joy is now too painful to think about. The thought of their children, they were promised to come to the Lord, but now 10 years has gone by, and, and they, just, it's, they can't talk about it anymore. The dream, the vision, the promise, it no longer brings joy, it brings a lot of pain, and it has left a stench in their nostrils. So Jesus says, he says, bring me to the place where something has died, and with all the crowd there, he stands in front of that tomb, and what does he say? Write it down, he says, take away the stone. And then he says, what does he say? Lazarus, come out. Come forth. Scholars say if he didn't say Lazarus, he would have emptied the graves all around. <laughs> Jesus, in essence, was saying to this crowd, I have the final word, and I am the final word. My plan is so much bigger than what you can imagine. 
You know the thing that has died. Jesus is the master of making dead things live again. Let me ask you, what has died in you? What have you given up on? What has left a bad stench in your nostrils? What is your Lazarus? I want you to name it. What is it? Is it finances? Is it relationships? Is it ministry? Is it serving? Is it giving? What is it that has taken your will and broke it? And you've just said, I'll never do that again. I want you to put a name to it because Jesus is the master of making dead things live again. You know what, the name Lazarus is so cool. As we wrap this up this morning and the worship team comes, his name means whom God helps. It also means God is my help. Either way, think about that. What is the Lazarus in your life? When Lazarus comes out, what does he say? Take off those grave clothes. This man is alive. And I'm here to tell you, you see, we love God's overt operation, but a lot of times he's doing covert op. And we don't even fully understand. We don't know fully what is going on. Listen, in this story, there was no way, even when Jesus tried to explain it, they didn't get exactly what was happening. There was no way they understood that Jesus was up to something much, much bigger than just raising Lazarus from the dead. Do you know Jesus already had in this, his mind, this is going to be written about through the annals of time. My church is going to hear about what has happened, and it will encourage people from generation to generation to generation generation, this story will be told. What about in your life? Some things that have died in you, 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 you've given up on, and Jesus is saying, listen, let it live again. You may not fully understand it. It may even happen after you die, but it will be told from generation to generation to generation. I will use it for my glory. Four things that you always have to remember. When you are faced with overwhelming circumstances and this trumps anything that we are going through, it is for God's glory. It is for God's plan. It is for your sake and it is for the benefit of others. Go on and read the story and see how many people got saved in this story. It was for their benefit. Imagine, can you imagine the party they had? When Lazarus came out of there and they went from sorrow to joy, they went from anger and disappointment to praising their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But what do you think those four days were like for Mary and Martha? How were they feeling towards Jesus during that time? We have to protect ourselves from the enemy getting a foothold. You see, you were meant to be a force like an African elephant to go out into this world and make a difference. But the enemy knows if I can just discourage you, I can keep you captive with nothing more than a little rope and a stake and you'll no longer believe for anything great again. Discouragement. What are you discouraged about today? As we wrap this service up, I'm going to call you forth today. I want you to put a name to it. What is it? And it's time for something that was dead to live again. It's time to believe again. It's time to stand again. And as we begin to sing, just like Lazarus was called out of that grave, when you walk from your seat to this front and you release this to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you're saying, God, I trust you. I believe you. You are bigger than all things. And I know you are at work in this situation, even though I don't understand it. How many of you know There are covert operations happening in the military all around the world right now. We may never even know what they've done to protect us, to save us, to use, to to better the United States, so to speak. How many of you know, I may not fully understand it, but I trust that God is up to something in my life that's for His glory, His plan, my benefit, and for the benefit of others. So today... There's going to be some chains broken. There's going to be some elephants released again that are going to believe for great things this morning. Could we all stand? I want to lower the lights this morning. We've saved some time today so that we could come to this altar. And I don't want you to move. If you're not serious, stay where you are. 
But if you really are saying, God, I've been discouraged in some areas of my life. And I am walking down here. It's okay that you've been angry. We've got our Marthas out here. We've got our Marys out here. It's time for you to come to this altar. And it's time to say, Jesus, you are the master of making dead things live again. I'm not going to give up because you haven't given up on me. So I want you to begin to come and just spend some moments with the Lord today. Let's begin to sing. Come on. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Lord. Prayer team, come and lay hands on people this morning. Just lift your hands to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, I know you're at work, Lord. Thank you. Some of you, you've been discouraged, man. If that discouragement takes root, the enemy will use it. Come on now. We're going to the graveyard. <laughs> Dead things are coming alive. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus breaks every chain. He breaks every chain. There is, there is no promise that God has given to his people. There is no vision or dream that God has given to you that's impossible for him. The enemy will lie to you. The enemy will bring discouragement your way so that you will just give up and abandon the promise. But I am, I am challenging you this morning that you serve a God that makes dead things live again. I am challenging you this morning to let you know that, that God is up to something even though you don't understand it, even though you don't know what's going on, even though the years have rolled by and you're wondering when this is going to come about, God is still at work in this situation. And sometimes God allows things to come to the point of completely dying. You know why? He likes for the odds to be completely against him so he can show how awesome he really is. The greater the odds, the more awesome he is. 
The only problem that we face is allowing discouragement to settle in and to get us to walk away from the promise of God. Listen, for the children of Israel, God promised them the promised land. It was theirs, but they walked away from it. So it is a conditional promise. You have to hold on to it and believe for it, and you have to walk towards it, and then God will do his part. But if you let go and walk away, you will never see it happen. You play a part in it all. You're a part of it. Listen, he's not disappointed in you. He knows what the enemy's been doing in you. He knows what's been happening. Mary and Martha, what a beautiful example. But today, I want you to just name it. Just just put your hands to heaven. Father, in Jesus' name, I give you, give it to him right now. I give it to you, Lord. You're calling it forth in Jesus' name. Let this thing live again, God. God, give me a passion. Give me a desire. Devil, I rebuke you. I will keep believing. I will keep fighting. I will keep standing because he is running after me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's no mountain you won't climb, God. Thank you, Lord. I am free. I am free. Hallelujah, Lord. These chains have no hold on me. They have no hold. I am healed. Come on now. Embrace every chain. Discouragement go with Jesus' name. I am free. I am free. Hallelujah, Lord. Anybody been set free this morning? Hallelujah. Listen, discouragement. Discouragement is a major, it's a major tool of the enemy. Major. You quit on one thing, right? You give up on one promise and the enemy knows he he wants you to give up on future promises. He wants to start a pattern in your life. But that pattern is broke today in Jesus' name. And we decided on our way out of here, We were going to sing one final song that was upbeat. 
that Jesus is calling us out of the grave. And so we want to sing this song as we go. And then I want to say we need at least 200 people to sign up because we're going to rock this city for Jesus right here from New Life. I want you to sign you and your family up, Cinco de Mayo. You're going to go right to the back at the end after we sing this song and sign up. And we're going to do amazing things for Jesus. Let's sing this song. Here we go. You ready? Come on.
Anybody fired up in this place? Man, what a good Sunday. Praise God. Jesus is the final word.